All right, happy Friday, November 13th. This is urinary part one. My goal is to get through the anatomy of the kidney, the nephron, the histology, and then get all the way to glomerular filtration. So what's going on in the renal uh, capsule, renal corpuscle, um, so we can talk about how the sampling of the plasma occurs. So from the big picture side of things, the urinary system is going to have the two kidneys, the two ureters, which connect the kidneys to the bladder, and then the urethra. And remember, in the males, the urethra is coinciding with the exit point for sperm in the penis. And in the women, the urethra is fairly small. Part of the problem with that small urethra in women means you are more prone towards uh, urinary tract infections, because it's a smaller access um, distance for pathogens to potentially get into your bladder. The urinary system has three big things. So it's going to excrete waste. It's going to do the elimination of the urine. So the kidneys is where we're going to excrete waste products taken from our filtrate. We're going to secrete excess waste products into the filtrate. And then we're going to collect that filtrate and eliminate this urine. And part of what we're doing in in excreting and secreting is maintaining water homeostasis and we're maintaining blood pH homeostasis. Okay. So the kidneys are our primary organ. And again, excretion is a big part of what the nephron does. So every minute, every day, the kidneys are getting about a quarter of your cardiac output. So of cardiac output of um, five liters per minute, the kidneys are somehow getting about 120 to 125 milliliters per minute. So when you calculate that out to how much blood is being passed through the kidneys in a day, and again, you know, you make little slight adjustments based upon activity and some sympathetic outflow reproduction, re redistribution, but you should be filtering about 200 liters of blood a day at all of the nephrons through both kidneys. And so that's quite a bit of your blood supply. All right, so you have four to six liters of blood, so it's getting filtered 50 times a day, 60 times a day, okay? And as it's being filtered, that allows you an opportunity to remove toxins, remove metabolic waste to include ammonia, urea, carbon dioxide in the form of hydrogens, excess, um, some amino acids, and excess ions such as potassium or chloride, and all of that will become part of what is the solutes in the urine. And some of the water is going to remain because of the population, the concentration of solutes that accumulate in that urine, and some of the hormone factors as well. Okay, So in the filtration, in the excretion secretion, we are going to have some some ability to manipulate what our blood looks like, both chemically in terms of pH levels. So we usually get rid of hydrogens and retain bicarbs, negative ions that can help us buffer hydrogen ion content and load. That's what helps make our blood slightly basic, 7.4. We're going to help kind of keep around the protein levels, the excess hormones, the excess antibodies, the excess ions, and in doing so, manipulate our solute levels so the blood maintains a certain amount of water and maintains a certain viscosity. And that's the osmoregulation, so the water levels of the blood based upon the osmolarity, the solute concentration. All right, glucose is a big thing. All right, so the kidneys are going to play a role in somewhat maintaining blood glucose levels. The goal is, as long as your glucose levels are less than 300 milligrams per deciliter, the kidneys should be retaining all that glucose, helping to ensure there's glucose in the bloodstream. You're never hypoglycemic, you're never hyperglycemic, and you have glucose available for the brain. The kidneys even can, some of the cells, undergo gluconeogenesis if prolonged fasting is occurring to help generate more glucose to put into the bloodstream, in addition to the liver doing that. And remember, gluconeogenesis, we get our building blocks from lactic acid, from, um, from amino acids, such as alanine, or from the glycerol as we break down our um, triglycerides to make the free fatty acids our energy molecules. All right, going back to the heart. The blood pressure regulation of the kidneys in some ways is dependent upon regulating the water levels of the body. 
Having more water retained, more water kept, means higher blood pressure because there's more blood volume. So blood pressure control at the kidneys is more of that long-term regulation, and it relates usually to the regulation of solutes, the regulation of water levels, and therefore the pressure of the blood volume on the vessels. Okay, the kidneys are going to have a hormone system of the renin-angiotensin pathway that help it retain fluid, retain solutes, retain water, and therefore increasing blood volume, which increases blood pressure. And then there are other vasomotor and blood pressure regulations that occur with these um, hormones in that pathway on sympathetic or on um, blood vessels themselves and stretch receptors and things like that. The kidneys also respond to like uh, atrial nitriuretic peptide, uh, ADH, um, or the lack of ADH, and your brain nitriuretic peptide, and other diuretic kind of hormones to help, in some ways, dump fluid and to keep blood pressure down. Okay? The kidneys only have the renal artery coming in, so there's only one blood vessel coming in. If that one blood vessel is not delivering sufficient oxygen to the cells of the kidney, that's going to be a problem. So the kidneys can't open up more collaterals, open up more blood vessels to bring more blood into their capillary beds. They are limited because there's only the renal artery. So the kidneys then have this functional ability to increase the red blood cell count of the blood, hoping that if the kidneys are only going to get 125 milliliters of blood, for every microliter having 4 million red blood cells, let's up that to 5 million red blood cells. And if you calculate how many more red blood cells and oxygen carrying capacity that translates to within that 125 milliliters, it's quite significant. So how do the kidneys do that? By making and releasing the urethropotent hormone, EPO. All right, so calcium regulation. All right, remember the calcium regulation is going to be altered in the kidneys, and one of the ways that happens is the vitamin D, whether it's taken in from diet or taken in and made by your cells by the response to sunlight, part of what vitamin has to, de has to become is calcitriol. And then in, as calcitriol, that plays a role in the absorption and the retaining and the keeping of calcium, which then helps the bones be a deposit for that calcium, and the kidneys play a role in that. So let's focus a little bit on other organ systems have a role in excretion and elimination, okay? And everyone does their little part. So the respiratory system helps us eliminate carbon dioxide, the metabolic waste product made by breaking down glucose into water and carbon dioxide, right? The integumentary system helps us get rid of some water through insensible as well as sensible perspiration. It helps us get rid of some of the um, sodium, potassium, chloride, ions, uh, and salt as you are secreting the sweat. It helps us somewhat get rid of a little bit of lactic acid and urea in that sweat. Okay? But it's not able to get rid of all of that. All right? So we need other mechanisms to be able to help us rid us of those waste products. The digestive tract also helps us get rid of some water with fecal matter, some solutes, some salts, carbon dioxide, some lipids, some of the bile pigments, and the cholesterol. But again, the digestive system is helping us get rid of a lot of that stuff because it's not useful to take into the body. And we do secrete some things and in addition to what was, is not useful for us in the digestive processing of the food, but it's still not enough by itself. So the urinary system is going to be the big site for metabolic waste in the form of hydrogen ions and some carbon dioxide being converted to that. Some of the toxins that the liver can't completely break down by itself will be lost and secreted through filtration and secretion in the nephron and drugs, same thing. Uh, some of the excess hormones, and we see this with like reproductive hormones. One of the ways we can test to see if you're pregnant or you're ovulating is you're looking for that excess LH hormone at ovulation. You're looking for excess human HCG hormone from the embryo that's producing uh, HCG to maintain the corpus luteum and progesterone levels. And there is so much of it that it spills over into the um, filtrate and then gets a little secreted and then ends up in your urine. All right? Again, salts being uh, hydrochloric acid, some calcium carbonate, cal you know, some of those different um, combinations of ions, and then hydrogen and water. Okay? 
Where is the kidney located? All right, it's located retroperitoneal. So what they're trying to show you over here is it's behind the peritoneum along with the pancreas, along with some of the back muscles, the spinal cord, and there's a lot of fat in there and around it. Okay. It's typically location-wise around the 12th thoracic to the third lumbar vertebra. Your right kidney is a little lower than the left because of the way the liver pushes down on it. And your lateral surface is considered convex and your medial surface is considered concave. Right. There's one big entry point like it was in the afferent nephron or the nephron, not sorry like it was with the lymphatic nodules, the lungs, everything is known as a hillis. All right, so this entry point into that concave um, portion where the renal artery, the renal vein, the lymphatic vessels, nerves, all those things, the ureter comes out is going to be your hillis or hilum if you're talking about one of them. Okay. All right, for anatomy. The first thing we look at with the kidney is, all right, there's a fibrous cap, okay, a renal capsule, and that renal capsule is going to have some different layers to it. There's going to be a, a fat-rich part. There's going to be a um, kind of collagen-rich part, all right, and it's the tough capsule, all right. The cortex is going to be the first layer you come to if you're dissecting from the outside towards the inside. And the cortex is lighter colored. It's a superficial region with all of the nephrons, specifically the capsules of the nephron that are going to have the capillary bed where filtration occurs. The next layer is going to be the medulla. The medulla is going to contain the columns and the pyramids. The columns are going to allow for blood vessels to go towards the cortex that are coming in from the hilum, and it's going to have the blood vessels leaving the cortex coming back through the renal vein to become, you know, deposit that blood into the inferior vena cava. It's going to have the pyramids, which are going to collect, be the collecting duct location. Some of the loops are going to fall in there, and it's going to be a very solute-rich interstitial fluid. So there's going to be a lot of ions. There's going to be a lot of molecules in the interstitium of the medulla, and we are going to use that to our advantage to help us with water retention in the nephron. The renal pelvis is going to be kind of the funnel in the very center at the hilum, and then it's the collection and part that's going to connect directly to the ureters. It's going to be because at the bottoms of the pyramids, where all the little points are, um, you're going to have all the collecting ducts kind of funneling to that point and releasing their liquid contents into that uh, minor calluses, and those minor calluses will connect to major calluses, and then they'll end up being this nice kind of pelvis, this nice little sac that then connects into the ureters, okay? So looking at that in a picture, again, the outside is the capsule, and there's a part of this that's going to be a fat-rich area, like your book talks about, and there's going to be a part of this that's, a, you know, collagen, connective tissue rich, okay? Then you're going to have the cortex, and the cortex is going to be all of this, all right? It's going to be this lighter colored. It's going to be where the little nephron capsules are located, and most of the proximal distal convoluted tubules are located, okay? The medulla is going to be, all right, all of this middle part to include the columns and the pyramid, all right? And the pyramids are base and then the triangle, all right? The pelvis is going to be, okay, from here with the sinuses, all the, all right, minor. So minor means it's on one pel uh, in a pyramid. The majors when two or more of the minors come together. Okay, and then this little kind of sac part. Also included are going to be these little sinuses, and typically in those sinuses, you're going to see a lot of fat, right? You're going to see this big deposit of fat, okay? And that fat is wrapped around the vessels, and that vessel, the renal arteries are breaking off into segmental, and then interlobular, and then arcuate, and then cortical radial. And that's the blood supply. So again, remember, your kidneys typically get a fourth um, or a quarter of your uh, cardiac output at rest. Now, when you start exercising, they get less because that, that um, 
that blood supply is somewhat redistributed more towards the skeletal muscles and less towards the GI tract and the kidneys. But when you're at rest, so sitting right here and listening to me, you should be sending a quarter of your cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output's about five liters a minute. So if you do the math, a quarter of that should be, you know, a dollar twenty-five. So a dollar twenty to a dollar twenty-five of five is going to be your amount sent to both kidneys combined. So technically, for you know, simplicity, they say 120 milliliters, and then 600 milliliters goes to the right kidney, 600 milliliters goes to the left kidney. Okay? And then that 600 mils is coming in on the renal artery. And then that renal artery is then splitting into a few segments. And the segments are going to be heading to the individual, all right, lobes of the kidney, the renal lobes. And so you have interlobular, which are going to be the vessels that are going to carry blood in the columns of the medulla. And then once they flatten out and head towards the base of the medulla, they are curate. And then they're going to start having smaller vessels pick up and run to all of these individual capsules. That's going to be our cortical radial. And once we're at the capsule level, now we're talking about arterioles. And there's an afferent arterial going into the capsule. There's a capillary bed within that capsule that's known as the glomerulus. So the capillary name for the vessels where filtration is occurring, that capillary network is a glomerulus. And when that capillary network comes back out of the nephron, it is going to be an efferent arterial. So there's still arterial blood going into and out of the nephrons. So what does that mean? There's no oxygen, glucose given up to cells. The only thing that's taken is by the force of filtration, a sampling of the plasma. So a little bit of the water, a little bit of the solutes. The solutes can include amino acids, can include glucose, can include solutes, uh, sodium, potassium, iron, um, calcium, uh, saturated oxygen, saturated carbon dioxide, bicarb, okay? But, but um, we're not taking oxygen from the hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin and the uh, red blood cells and the white blood cells should not be lost in the nephron, just a sampling of the plasma, the water part, okay? Now, the efferent arterial and the afferent arterial are two, basically, points of manipulation. Okay, how much we filter out of the glomerulus, the capillary bed in the capsule, is dependent upon the fluid amount in the capsule, in the, in the capillary bed. And that's going to be high hydrostatic pressure. So we can make it pressure really high in the glomerulus by dilating the afferent arterial. So we put a lot of blood into that capillary bed and constricting the efferent. And so it's kind of like a tub. When you when you stop the way the fluid leaves and you open up the hoses to let a lot in, the tub, tub's going to start to fill, right? And more fluid in those capillaries is more pressure, and that's going to drive more filtration or more fluid to leak into the capsule and into the nephron and become filtrate, all right? So anytime you open, dilate the afferent, and constrict the efferent, you should see filtration go up. And because there's more pressure, more fluid in the capillaries, so more is going to, more fluid can leak out. Anytime you dilate the afferent, or dilate the efferent and constrict the afferent, now you're not putting as much fluid in and you're letting the out fluid out faster than you're putting in, so you should see pressure go down. And because the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus is going to go down, you're going to see filtration also go down. Less fluid is going to leak out. All right, and so what this gives you, in some ways, having an afferent and efferent arterial is two places you can just slightly manipulate in and out of the fluid to make sure the pressure in the glomerulus is where you want it, so filtration is where you want it. Okay, so it gives you like two levels of control. Now, the efferent is going to start to connect to the capillary beds that are going to actually be involved in oxygen delivery, glucose delivery, fat delivery, and then picking up from the interstitial amino acids, excess glucose, um, uh, sodium, potassium, hydrogens, whatever, bicarb, uh, the, the amino acids we want to keep, all right? So that, that capillary network is known as peri, so around tubular, around the tubes of the nephron. 
Okay? And for the nephrons that extend deep into the medulla, we are going to also know the peritubular capillary as the vasorecta. Okay, so the vasorecta is more specifically for capillaries in the medulla, typically around the nephrons that it loops that extend deep into the medulla and are going to play a big role in helping us retain water in those loops. Right? And then the paratubular capillaries and the vasorecta, as the fluid starts to come back towards venules, it's going to be deoxygenated. It's going to have picked up whatever nutrients have been reabsorbed. But in general, it should be devoid of some of the glucose and the triglycerides because the, these cells have had to make fuel for their ATP needs. Okay? And then it will collect back to cortical radiate veins accurate veins, interlobular veins, and then to the renal vein, and then go into the inferior vena cava. Okay? So now let's talk about the nephron. The nephron is going to be the functional, structural, important unit in the kidney. You have to have functional nephrons to, for the kidneys to work. And your goal is to have millions and millions and millions of nephrons in the right kidney and millions and millions and millions of nephrons in the left kidney, and they work together to take that cardiac output, about a quarter of your blood, every second, every minute, and filter it. So take a sampling, return 99.9% .9 of it, but what they don't return and what they secrete and ends up in your urine is stuff you don't need. So it keeps your body in homeostasis for pH, for water, for solutes, for ions, for proteins, for amino acids, and you then function more efficiently. Right? Now, for kidney function, like I said, you have millions of these nephrons. You can actually make up a significant loss of nephrons and no longer, whether they're dead, they've died, they no longer function correctly and still be okay. But it's a slippery slope. Once you lose a pretty significant amount of nephrons, the kidneys are then no longer sufficiently filtering enough blood per minute per day to maintain homeostasis, and then you very quickly end up on dialysis. Right? Can we survive without a kidney? Technically, no. But what we have figured out is how to purify our blood outside of the kidneys, and that's called the dialysis machine. And so through being on dialysis, now think about it. Some people are on dialysis six days a week for hours at a time. Do they have a great quality of life? No. But are they alive? Yes. So there's something to it of you, you can kind of live with kidney failure, kidney dysfunction, live on dialysis, but it's not a really great quality of life, okay? And there is some research out there about dieting. So if you eat like a vegan diet, you eat um, diets that are, there's some specific nitrogen sparing diets, so you try not to eat too much protein. There are lots of diets out there for people with kidney issues, kidney disease, kidney dysfunction. You need to avoid certain foods, certain Toxin, uh, toxic compounds, and the goal will be maybe to see some recovery of kidney function by not overloading it, stressing it with lots of nitrogen compounds and proteins and amino acids. Okay? So let's talk about the nephron. Technically, there are four parts of the nephron, and then some books actually include the collecting duct, so I put it here as well. All right? The nephron, again, is a structural functional unit of the kidney that forms urine. It is a tube of epithelial lined tube and associated vessels near that tube, kind of like the lung blood interface, except now we're a tube of fluid inside, blood vessel near, and what we're doing is letting things enter and leave the bloodstream and secrete into the urine or things in the urine come filtrate back into the bloodstream. The first part of the nephron where the filtration happens, where the sampling of plasma occurs, is known as the renal corpuscle. So not the renal capsule, it's the renal corpuscle. Okay? The renal corpuscle is the capillary bed, known as the glomerulus, and the capsule, which is known as Bowman's capsule, together. Okay? So the glomerulus is the capillaries. It is a fenestrated capillary bed. There's no oxygen exchange, no glucose or fuel delivery, no pickup of waste products. It strictly is a capillary network that has pores, so it's fenestrated, that allows based upon pressure, hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus versus the hydrostatic pressure in the capsule, the oncotic pressure in the capillary versus the oncotter pressure in the capsule to influence how much fluid, how much solutes, how much sampling, how much filtration 
is occurring, and the blood leaving the efferent vessel is going to be slightly more thick or viscous because a small bit of the plasma is lost. Okay. Now, the glomerular capsule, we'll go into this here, is made up of two layers. Okay. It has kind of a um, visceral layer and a parietal layer, and technically between the visceral and the parietal layer is a little bit of a space where this fluid, this filtrate can accumulate. The visceral layer is going to be a modified epithelial cell known as a podocyte that is going to work with the fenestrated endothelial cells of the glomerulus capillaries to form a um, barrier to make sure red blood cells, white blood cells, and really, really big pro protein complexes or things are not getting out. Okay? They stay in the bloodstream. All right? The parietal layer is going to be simple squamous epithelium and a basement membrane um, kind of to anchor on, and that basement membrane will contain some connective tissue. Okay? Now, once the fluid is in the capsule between the podocytes and the simple squamous epithelium, it's going to start to be funneled, because there's no way back into the bloodstream here, so it's going to be funneled into the tubing of the rest of the nephron. The first part of that tubing is known as the proximal convoluted tubule, sometimes known as the PCT. There's going to be simple cuboidal cells here that are going to be rich in microvilli, and by having rich in microvilli, they're going to have a lot of membrane surface area with proteins embedded in that membrane that can interact with the filtrate in the lumen, the fluid that's been taken from the plasma, and start the process of returning 99.9% .9 of that filtrate back to the blood supply. Now, in order to do this, in many cases, what's in the filtrate has to be pumped or diffused or channeled into the cell, and then from inside that simple cuboidal cell has to be pumped, channeled, or moved in from the inside of that cell into the interstitial space so it can then maybe hitch a ride in the plasma of the blood in the paratubular or vasorectal capillary beds. So there's going to be a high metabolic demand for making fuel into ATP and then using that ATP to drive pumps because, again, Sodium may want to go into the cell, but sodium doesn't necessarily want to leave the cell. And so in order to get sodium into the blood, right, at some point you're going to have to pump it against the gradient. And so there's going to be need for ATP to be expended to do that. Okay? Most of what happens in the proximal convoluted tubule is, a, is reabsorption occurs based upon how many um, channels, proteins you have embedded in the membranes of these cells, and what, is they, what can they move from the filtrate back into the blood supply, given that um, there's, they can work at efficiency and only move so many molecules per second per minute. Okay? Now, the loop of Henle is going to be two parts. There's a thick part and a thin part. The thick part is normally going to have cuboidal cells, simple cuboidal cells, like the proximal and the distal convoluted tubule. And then the thin part will be squamous cells. Now, part of the reason why there's thin and thick is there's different functions. The thick is going to be where water doesn't move, but we can move some of the solutes, some of the ions, into the interstitial space to help maintain the interstitial space as a high solute concentration. And that helps make sure the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid is much greater than what's in the filtrate. And so when water can move in the thin portions, water is sucked, kind of like salt water um, in that interstitial fluid. It sucks all that water out of our urine, out of our filtrate, so we can retain it. Okay? And then the distal convoluted tubule is going to be, again, simple cuboidal cells like earlier, but this time we're not going to have as much microvilli. This time we're not going to have as much mitochondria. We are going to have more receptors on these cells related to hormones. So A and P, atrial nitriactic peptide, B and P, brain nitriactic peptide, aldosterone from the um, adrenal, uh, adrenal cortex, um, a little bit of ADH here, uh, just a bunch of your hormones that can have an effect. Okay. And then the collecting duct is going to be simple cuboidal cells. They are typically going to be low in mitochondria, and they are going to only really respond to ADH. So by the time you get to the collecting duct, ADH is your last-ditch effort at this point to influence what's happening between the filtrate and the interstitial fluid, and ADH is the role there.
So when we look at the picture again, here is our corpuscle. Inside is a glomerulus, which is a capillary network. It's going to have a podocyte visceral cell layer wrapped on top of those endothelial cells. And then there will be simple squamous epithelium and some connective tissue on the outside. We're going to have a proximal convoluted tubule, so the PCT. Then we're going to have a loop, and there will be a thick and thin portion. The thick is going to be where solutes are taken into this interstitial space. So we maintain a high concentration of solutes. So when we get to the thin part where water can exit, we can recruit that water to exit. Right. Distal convoluted tubule, this is where we tend to see our hormones come into play. And then that's technically the nephron. Now, a lot of different nephrons feed into a common tube known as the collecting duct. And it's the collecting duct that's going to head into the medulla through the pyramid to the minor calluses and the, to that papillary duct, that point at the point of the pyramid where you meet and collect all that fluid, and then it flows into the calluses. Okay? And the medulla is going to be where ADH has its last ditch effort to retain water. Otherwise, water's lost, and it becomes part of a very water-rich urine. Okay? Now, when we look at the nephrons, if anatomically they spend a lot of their loop and a lot of their space surface area in the medulla, in the pyramid, they are considered a juxtamedullary nephron. If they spend most of their tubing and most of their time in the um, corte uh, cortex, they are considered a cortical nephron. As humans, this is what we majority of our nephrons are, these cortical nephrons. While they have more convoluted tubule parts, uh, they are going to potentially not get use of the medulla and the interstitial fluid that the medulla is rich in solutes versus the filtrate. So they're not going to be as effective at retaining water compared to our juxtamedullary. Okay? Um, they are going to be a large portion of our nephrons because, again, think about our cortex. A lot of them, you know, a lot of nephrons are up near that border, and only a few are close to the medulla. Right. These over here are going to, again, the, the capillary network is going to be known more specifically as the vasorecta. It's still a paratubular capillary. Okay. And um, we're going to do a much better job of retaining water. Animals that have more juxtamedullary um, type nephrons tend to tolerate arid climates better. So some of those like arid desert mice and camels and different animals, they have a higher density of juxtamedullary nef um, nephrons, therefore they tolerate and make more concentrated urine, lose less water, and live and survive longer than we would in that environment. Okay? And that's just going on more here. Now one thing to remember is when we did the picture earlier, we tend to show the nephron kind of in a flat, spread out manner. All right, if you look in this picture and in this picture, what you see is that the nephron, to make sure there's millions and millions of them, actually fold and cross back onto itself, right? And we utilize that because when the distal collecting duct comes back towards the, I'm sorry, the distal convoluted tubule heads to the collecting duct, Part of that distal convoluted tubule is going to sit at this juncture, all right, where the afferent and efferent arterial enter and exit the uh, renal corpuscle. And what this is is an important part of feedback. If this nephron is filtering things too fast, all right, so it's filtering more fluid too quickly, what's coming back in the distal convoluted tubule is going to be very water rich and very potentially solute low. And so there are mechanisms in place to be able to sense that osmolarity and solute concentration and chemical makeup that are going to then potentially alter afferent arterial and efferent arterial um, radius to basically either bring up or bring down the filtration rate so we can better match how much we're filtering versus how much we're recovering, right? And that's the juxtaglomerular feedback mechanism. 
Okay. Let's focus a little bit more on that renal corpuscle. Again, the glomerulus is a capillary bed. It is composed of these simple squamous endothelial cells that are going to be fenestrated, so very porous, very big holes or gaps between the cells and in the cells. Now, these gaps potentially could let big things out. So to somewhat do a little bit more of a barrier, the visceral part of the Bowman's capsule is that these cells, which are like uh, simple squamous epithelial, but have unique kind of uh, foot-type um, interactions with each other, are going to be known as the podocytes. And they are going to work to make sure that if things are really big or the holes are really big, there's a second layer to filtration. So think about like your, um, think about, okay, I have a jar full of sand, dirt, and rocks, right? Initially, what I do is I pour it into maybe a big kind of rusty grate to try to get the big rocks out. And then the second tier would be to separate the dirt from the sand. I put a more finely maybe mesh great to let only the sand fall out and not the, you know, medium-sized pebbles. So that's what you're kind of doing. The fenestrated holes might be bigger pores, bigger openings, and some of the bigger things might be able to get past that, but because the way the podocytes make these little gaps, they can help prevent and ensure big things like red blood cells and white blood cells aren't going to actually exit and get out of the bloodstream. Okay? All right. And these are just more pictures to, again, show what the podocyte looks like, to show you what the capillary looks like, and to show you how um, the way the gaps are made, that even though they're quite big, bigger than normal capillaries, there's still some um, protection to losing red blood cells and losing white blood cells and platelets and the big components, the formed elements from the, um, from the filtration factors. Okay. So this is just another picture to go through, again, histology. So we have the afferent arterial. The afferent arterial, like arterials, is going to have simple squamous endothelium with some smooth muscle cells around it, right? The efferent is going to be a little smaller, and we, we would expect that because technically it's losing some of the fluid, so there's less fluid leaving. But it, again, is going to have simple squamous endothelia, and it's going to have some smooth muscle around it. Okay. The, if you look, here's a simple squamous epithelium, simple squamous epithelium. Once you start getting into the glomerular capsule, those simple squamous cells are going to start to have more holes, more fenestrations. And then if we look at the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule, we see the podocytes are more simple squamous epithelium, but they're kind of interlocking these finger-like projections to ensure that not all the big stuff, in addition to what gets out of the fenestrated, only the small plasma, small solutes get filtered out. Okay. The layer here is going to be our parietal layer, right? and it's going to be a um, parietal epithelium, so a simple squamous epithelium and a basement membrane. Remember that basement membrane will have collagen elastin and some, you know, extracellular matrix that gives the capsule its kind of tough exterior, okay? There is a significant space between the visceral and the parietal layer, and that space is important because that's where the filtrated fluid, the fluid forced out of the blood supply by the pressure of the fluid in this glomerular uh, capillary network, it accumulates, and it has no way to go out except through the rest of the nephron. And so that's why it flows out. And it flows through the proximal, through the loop, and then part of it will come back through the distal. Okay? And the distal here is going to be simple, cuboidal, just like the proximal. But at this inner action of where the simple cuboidal of the distal comes back and gets really close to the afferent arterial, those cells are going to be modified into what's known as a macula densa. And they are going to be cells that are osmoreceptors, so they can sense the amount of water in the fluid of the lumen, and they can sense chemical makeup of the lumen, so pH and solute levels. And by being able to sense that, they can do a check on are we filtering 
too much too fast and therefore losing too much water, losing too many maybe important solutes? Or are we filtering too slow and too little and what's coming back at the end of the nephron is really water law, uh, water absent, thickly solute pH, you know, amount. And based upon those interactions, these cells can then kind of mem um, alter and change what's going on at the um, afferent arterial to make it constrict or, re or um, constrict or dilate and therefore increase or decrease the amount of blood in the glomerulus at any given time, which could increase or decrease the pressure, which then could increase or decrease filtration. Okay. Again, just another picture to kind of go through the histology. All right. So again, histology is important. In the proximal convoluted tubule, we have cuboidal epithelial cells. These cells have to have a lot of membrane interacting with the filtrate, so they are going to be rich in microvilli, meaning their membrane is going to have lots of folds and um, to it with lots of proteins embedded. In many cases, those proteins are going to be pumps that require energy, so there's going to need to be a lot of mitochondria in these cells to make a lot of ATP. The loop, again, the descending and ascending limbs are going to have a thick part of transporting solutes like potassium, calcium, hydrogens, sodium into the interstitial fluid. And then the thin part will be about water movement. So the thick is water impermeable. The thin is water permeable, solute impermeable. Okay. And then the distal convoluted tubule is cuboidal cells. And this is where our hormones have their effect. And then the collecting duct is cuboidal cells, last ditch effort, only ADH having a role here. All right? So let's look at it again. Here is our corpuscle. Within that corpuscle we see the parietal layer is a basement membrane and simple squamous epithelium. There is space in between, then we have the visceral layer, those polarocytes. Then we have the endothelial cells of the glomerulus. There's a space in between, fluid accumulates as pressure forces the fluid out. Again, on codex pulls a little bit back, but mostly pressure forces out. The net filtration pressure, fluid is entering now the tube. The initial proximal tube, mitochondria, microvilli, lots of interaction, lots of proteins, lots of pumps here and here, so we can pull in mostly what we filtered out. So most, almost all the glucose, so most of the sodium, most of the calcium, most of the amino acids, most of the molecules, the organic and some of the inorganic molecules are reclaimed right here in the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay. Then we look at the loop. And again, the loop, the thick segments are going to be similar to our collecting duct and proximal. Some cuboidal cells, water impermeable. Right? They're going to move some of the solutes. Whereas the thin is going to be these smaller um, simple squamous cells that are water permeable, so they're going to let water move but not solutes. Okay? When you get to the distal convoluted tubule, we see again cuboidal cells, some mitochondria, because there are some pumps here, but not as many as what was in the proximal. And we're going to have more hormone effects here. And then the collecting duct, the only hormone that has an effect is ADH. The only movement that you can possibly do here is if ADH puts water pores, aquaporons, on these cells and they retain water. Okay. Again, every nephron has a feedback loop of itself. Is what's going on in the distal collect convoluted tubule, all right, sufficiently representing the rate that you are taking away. So are we losing enough water and enough solutes, but not too many? And if we are losing too many, are we potentially filtering too much too fast? And if we're not losing enough water and solutes, are we potentially not filtering fast enough? Okay. And again, there's three cells that you worry about. The macula densa cells of the distal convoluted tubule have the chemo and the osmo receptors. So they are testing the filtrate for its level of solutes, its water content. They communicate to these specialized smooth muscle cells known as the juxtaglomerular cells, right? And these juxtaglomerular cells can be influenced by the macula densa. They can be influenced and triggered to dilate or to constrict, right? In addition, these juxtaglomerular cells are stretch receptors. So if, let's say, you have high blood pressure, if, let's say, you're sending too much blood to the kidneys just 
in a natural phenomenon, all right, the juxtaglomerular cells will see that increased stretch or decreased stretch and will try to constrict or dilate to accommodate that. If blood pressure is really, 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 really low, all right, so there's not a lot of stretch on these cells, meaning you don't have a good sufficient of blood volume, you don't have good blood pressure flowing through your body, these juxtaglomerular cells, as not being stretched, are going to start to make the renin hormone and that will lead to the RAS pathway, okay? The third cells are going to be these mesenglial cells, and I don't think it's represented on this picture, but the meson, oh, here they are, mesenglial matrix cells. These cells are also found in this juncture and are going to help coordinate some of the different communications between the macula densa, the juxtaglomerular, and the podocytes and the other cells of the system, okay? And there you go, the juxtaglomerular cells, macula densa, and then you have these mesenglial cells, okay? Again, there's a juxtaglomerular feedback of if this content in here is too rich in water, all right, too rich in maybe too many solutes or, um, or not enough solutes are being lost, or start the, whatever solutes are being lost or not being lost and whatever solutes are not being retained or not being retained, the macula densa can alter filtration by telling the juxtaglomerular cells we're filtering too much, too fast, constrict. If what's in here is very water, low, you know, lo, very low on water, very rich in waste products, it might be we're doing too good a job of retention and we're not filtering enough fluid in a given second. And so they could, these macula densis can communicate to the juxtaglomerular to dilate and get filtration up. Okay. So that's the juxtaglomerular feedback mechanism. It's a, how the kidney, each individual nephron, can somewhat manipulate its filtration rate based on how it's doing on the absorption side of the tube. All right, so urine formation. The first thing we have to do is get blood to the kidneys. So we have to pump. We have to have a cardiac output. We have to have a sufficient amount of blood supply. We have to have, you know, sedentary conditions, no huge sympathetic outflow that's causing redistribution of blood. And blood is going to go to the nephron. And in the nephron, because of the pressure in the glomerulus versus the pressure of the fluid in the capsule, we are going to have a pressure water gradient. And then because of oncotic solute concentration in the capsule and oncotic solute concentration in the blood um, plasma, we are going to have an oncotic pressure. And that is going to be the forces that lead to a net filtration out or no filtration, just like it is when we make lymphatic fluid of capillaries in our, um, in our other tissues, okay? After we get a filtrate, because there usually is a net filtration of about 10 millimeters of mercury pressure, so some of that fluid is lost. That fluid enters the tube. With Throughout the tube, there is reabsorption, reabsorption of things that we want to keep, maybe like sodium, glucose, okay? And then there's secretion, secretion of things like drugs, toxins, creatine, excess amino acids. And the water is going to, in many cases, follow the solute concentration and because of aldosterone and because of um, ADH and because of some other hormones, there will be specific places where water is retained by itself utilizing the gradient of oncotic solute concentration in the interstitium versus oncotic solute concentration in the filtrate. So let's talk about the first part of urine formation, which is that glomerular filtration. Again, it's about pressure. It's about solute concentration, right? There is a pressure in the capillary. That pressure in the capillary is going to come from the amount of blood pressure in the entire system and the amount of fluid that gets into the glomerulus. And because you're sending typically a quarter of your blood supply to your kidneys, and that fluid then should leak a little bit into the nephrons, you should be seeing of that 600 milliliters going to the right kidney, of that 600 milliliters going to the left kidney, 125 milliliters should be lost to filtrate, should enter the nephron tubes, okay? And so if you do the math again, 
if this is occurring and that's the filtration rate, you should be filtering your entire blood supply every 40 minutes. Now, this GFR rate is important because you need a normal GFR. You need a normal rate of filtration, a rate of removal of some of the fluid and the solutes from your blood supply so you can remove things that are toxic and harmful, so that way you maintain normal homeostasis, all right? And our kidneys do a pretty good job. As long as we get normal to somewhat half of normal levels of blood supply and then filtration, so you can almost lose potentially half of the nephrons or go down to one kidney, you should have normal amounts of filtration per minute, per second, which means your body should be able to maintain homeostasis. When you get below that half mark, that's where we start getting into diseases and disease problems, and maybe you're not getting rid of the water, you're not getting rid of some of the amino acids, you're not getting rid of some of the ammonia, and could lead to like gout, could lead to bloating, could lead to arrhythmias, could lead to blood pressure problems. And then if you get into that severely, you could go into kidney failure. Okay, so again, glomerular filtration. What is the hydrostatic pressure? That's the BP8, the blood hydrostatic pressure, all right? You will make it go up if you open the afferent, close the efferent. You will make it go up if you just close the efferent or if you just open the afferent. Anything that gets more blood, more water into the capillaries is going to make this go up. Under normal average circumstances, 120 over 80 for blood pressure, mean blood pressure of 100, the normal blood supply of 600 mils to one kidney, 600 mils to another, the blood pressure in each of those nephrons is about 60 millimeters of mercury, okay? And that's 60 millimeters of mercury versus what is the hydrostatic pressure of the fluid in the, between the podocyte and the uh, parietal epithelium is going to be driving fluid to come out. Okay, so the next part is going to be the uh, solute concentration, all right? Now, for the most part, there's a little bit of fluid in here and a little bit of solutes, but usually it's flowing into the proximal tubule, and so really and truly what's in this space is not very solute rich, and because it's compared to the blood. And so because some of the big things like albumin and red blood cells and platelets and things are staying in the blood supply, we are going to have higher solutes in the blood and that's then what's in the capsule here. And so that's going to help pull back in some of the water, back in some of the fluid. And then again, capsular pressure is pretty low, but that pretty low pressure does help drive again somewhat the fluid to go back into the um, capillary, okay? So when you take all these factors into play, all right, in general, under normal circumstances, you lose a little bit of plasma, you lose a bit of solutes and fluid to the nephron, and that's shown by the net filtration pressure. You will lose more, again, if you manipulate these things. If I make the hydrostatic pressure go up, like I said, by increasing afferent, I'm going to lose more fluid. Right? If, let's say, somehow I block this proximal tubule, I occlude it or I do something and I block it, right? over time, the capsular pressure is going to go up, it's going to go up, it's going to go up, and the uh, oncotic pressure is going to equal out. And so what you might see is you're going to lose less fluid in that nephron because as the fluid that is lost can't go anywhere, it's going to build and build and build, and eventually maybe you'll even retain fluid in that nephron. So those are ways that, again, you manipulate um, how much is lost at each individual nephron. Another way to reduce um, the filtration is really going to be to block or constrict the afferent and open up the efferent, and by doing that, this blood hydrostatic pressure will go down, and these other forces hold pretty constant, but the net filtration pressure will come down, right? The best way to manipulate the nephron is through the hydrostatic pressure, because the solutes, it's a little more complicated because that's the liver and that's disease states for the most part, but for most of us healthy people, the way we manipulate filtration rate is to manipulate afferent and efferent flow and therefore manipulate hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, which either leads to more hydrostatic pressure, more filtrate, less hydrostatic pressure, less filtrate. Okay. 
All right, once the filtration has occurred, now you have water, nutrients, essential ions that are now in the nephron, okay? You want to retain usually 99.9% .9 of that. And what you don't want to retain, what you want it to become left in the filtrate, pass through the ureters, end up in the bladder, and now it's urine. Right? Your kidneys will filter your entire body's plasma volume about 60 times a day. Okay? That's just the fluid part of your blood. Right? And your glomerular filtration rate is usually described as a number or a volume per minute. And again, it's going to be based upon mostly those hydrostatic forces, but those oncotic forces can play a role as well. If GFR is too high, if you are filtering more fluid, more solutes than you can reabsorb the effective amounts, you're going to have a high urine output because you're losing more water, more solutes than you are retaining. Okay? If GFR is too low, you absorb, reabsorb everything and you actually make less urine per second, so your urine output is really low and you end up possibly even retaining waste that you would prefer to maybe get rid of. Okay? Now, three mechanisms control GFR. There is the renal autoregulation. So think back to that juxtaglomerular feedback mechanism. That's part of it. And then think back to the juxtaglomerular smooth muscle cells around the afferent arterial being mechanoreceptors, being stretch receptors, and having that intrinsic ability to either when overstretch, kind of constrict a little bit, when understretch, kind of dilate a little bit. Okay? So within the Afferent arterial, the distal collecting duct, talking to the afferent arterial, there's a lot of control at each nephron level. Now, the nervous system can control whole blood pressure. Anytime your whole blood pressure goes up, more fluid technically should be going into the kidneys per beat per second under more pressure. And that should lead to more filtrate being taken. Okay. So the sympathetics aren't necessarily working at each individual kidney, each individual neuron or nephron. They're working at the whole blood pressure. So the ways to increase GFR are to increase total blood pressure, increase water intake, all right, and then the hormones that can increase blood pressure and increase water retention. And that is partly the renin-angiotensin system, also aldosterone, also ADH. And then how to get rid of glomerular filtration will be our ANP, BNP, right? So let's go through the renal autoregulation, OK? So normally, normal conditions, GFR is held pretty much at about 120 milliliters per minute across both kidneys, across all those nephrons, because each little nephron, each little afferent arterial has those juxtaglomerular mechanoreceptor cells that went overstretched, kind of constrict a little bit to make sure the fluid in the glomerulus stays at the right amount so the blood pressure is not too high in that glomerular capsule. And so there's just enough of the net filtration pressure to take a small sample of filtrate. If the blood pressure gets too low, the afferents try to dilate to get, again, a little bit more fluid into that glomerulus to keep the blood pressure and the filtr net filtration pressure perfect, okay? Now, if, let's say, what's going on at the proximal loop and distal collecting duct or distal convoluted tubule is working too well or not well enough, then that juxtaglomerular feedback mechanism can come to play. And so in addition to the juxtaglomerular cells kind of just doing minute, small constriction dilation effects, they can be encouraged to dilate or constrict a little bit more robustly based upon what is the filtrate looking like at the end of the nephron. Is it water rich or not water rich? Is it rich in certain solutes and waste products or not rich in those solutes and waste products? And that can be minor changes. And a lot of that happens without any conscious awareness, control. It's just all these little reflexes and feedback mechanisms, okay, at a cellular level. The second way filtration is altered is through neuro, um, neuro, neuro function. And mostly it's sympathetics, all right? And the sympathetics, because how do sympathetics increase blood pressure? They increase heart rate. They increase contractility. They increase... Um, the venous return, therefore increasing stroke volume. They put more fluid per second into the systemic system, and blood pressure goes up. More blood pressure, more fluid, potentially 
that means more filtration at the kidney level, right? And they, this, this is what's going on, right? And so anytime you have high blood pressure related to sympathetic outflow, you normally see a little bit more of um, filtration occurring, okay? Now, too much sympathetic is going to be somewhat inhibited because um, as the sympathetics start to stay longer term and work, they start to redistribute blood to the skeletal muscles. They start to constrict GFR to make sure there's enough blood to go to skeletal muscles so you can run away. And so that case, the sympathetic outflow with exercise and with redistributing blood will actually lead to a decreased GFR. Parasympathetic control, usually we're going to stop the sympathetic, so cardiac output comes down, blood pressure somewhat comes down, and we redistribute the blood back to about a quarter of the blood supply going back to the kidneys, and so GFR typically will increase back to normal. Okay. All right. Glomerular filtration is further affected through a hormonal effect. And the big hormonal effect is from initiated in the kidneys. It plays a little bit of a help with the liver making some items. But it's a, it starts and ends in the kidneys. So if the juxtaglomerular cells, those smooth muscle cells around the afferent arterial, are not being stretched enough, that would signal mean arterial pressure, blood pressure is low. Because you're not able to send a sufficient amount of blood to the kidneys per beat per minute. And that's going to trigger these cells to start releasing the hormone renin. Renin is going to travel in the bloodstream to the liver. And in the liver, it's going to help make the liver make and push to make angiotensinogen. And that can be converted then to angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1 can have some effects in the body. But the real effect for related to blood pressure and related to getting our blood pressure up, retaining fluid volume, is when renin leads to angiotensin 1 being made and angiotensin 1 getting exposed to this enzyme known as angiotensin converting enzyme, which stands for ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, which helps convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 is a hormone that has a lot of places to go. It's going to the brain, trigger ADH, release, trigger thirst. It's going to the uh, adrenal glands to trigger aldosterone release. It's going to some um, blood vessels to trigger arterial constriction, to increase afterload. Again, doing things, increasing afterload, increasing fluid volume, increasing thirst, increasing blood pressure is the goal. Increasing fluid volume, increasing blood vessel. Now, when I talked about the nephron earlier, I said most of the hormones work at the distal convoluted tubule. This is the one exception. One of the things angiotensin II can do is make more stimulate, you know, some, some gene expression and some increases in sodium and chloride channels, which could lead to more sodium and chloride retained, which could lead to more water retained, okay? Getting aldosterone released at the distal convoluted tubule means more sodium retained, more water retained, but we will lose more potassium. That's the trade-off. And then getting ADH is going to help us get thirsty. It's going to help us retain fluid at the aquaporons and the collecting duct. It's also going to help in high amounts even start vasoconstriction, so start constricting systemic arteries, getting, again, uh, afterload up. All right? We're going to constrict, again, a little bit of the afferent um, and the efferent, because while we're doing all these things, we don't want GFR to go up or down. We kind of want GFR to stay where it is, maybe even decline just a little bit so we can effectively see the sodium retention and water retention that we're trying to stimulate. All right? So that's what this is trying to show you. So when the kidneys start to sense Blood pressure is dropping, there's not adequate pressure, there's not adequate fluid, and the juxtaglomerular cells are not receiving the right amount of stretch, they make renin. Renin can help trigger the liver to make more angiotensinogen, which is a 453 amino acid long protein, and then that angiotensinogen can be converted to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 can do a lot of things, right? So it's a 10 amino acid long protein. One of the things that can be happening to it is in the presence of ACE, this angiotensin converting enzyme, two amino acids are pulled off and now it's known as angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 can go to the hypothalamus, ADH, thirst, retain water, right, the results of that. 
Angiotensin II can constrict vessels, can, um, can constrict and manipulate afferent, efferent arterioles and GFR a little bit. That can help us elevate blood pressure, elevate afterload, make sure reabsorption is matching filtration rate. And then it can help with aldosterone, which again can work on the kidneys as well as it can work on itself at the kidneys to retain sodium and retain water. Okay, so lots of different effects. The end result is the kidneys with sympathetic stimulation, with hypotension, with decreased sodium deliver. These are some of the things that can lead to that juxtaglomerular cells not being stretched or the macula densa cells may be seeing a problem and lead to the release of renin by those juxtaglomerular cells, lead to angiotensin II being made and all of the angiotensin effects. Right? And so some people with high blood pressure, this is what they do. This is what they think is the problem. So they take either ACE inhibitors or they take something to block this pathway to try to keep their blood pressure down by not having the RAS pathway work effectively. Okay? So at this point, you should be comfortable with some of the gross anatomy of the kidney, the cortex, the medulla, the pelvis, some of the landmarks. You should be able to tell me the blood supply, the arteries, all the way down to the glomerulus capillary bed and the paratubular capillary network back out to the inferior vena cava. You should be able to give me the nephron structures, the four main parts. You should be able to tell me the histology of those four main parts and then the collecting duct as well. You should be able to go within the specifics of the glomerular capsule, the Bowman's capsule, the two pieces of anatomy, the histology. You should be able to go into the glomerulus, the, the capillary network, and talk about how the pressures are regulated, the fluid volume, and how that leads to the filtration and the filtration rate. You should be able to talk about the juxtaglomerular feedback, the myo, um, the automatic feedback within the juxtaglomerular cells, the myogenic. You should be able to talk about other ways to control GFR and how GFR needs to be controlled because if it's not controlled, what can happen to other body parts and organs and the system as a whole. All right, we'll continue on on next Wednesday. And then don't forget, next Friday, we'll also do acid base. So we'll try to get through chapters 26 and 27. All right, have a good weekend. Bye.